Welcome you all to the Lord's House this afternoon. It's good to see each one gathered in the place of worship. I'm going to read some words from Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 and the verse 16. And John, on the Lord's day, has a vision of Christ. Revelation chapter 1. And in verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength when i saw him i fell and his feet as dead and he laid his right hand upon me saying unto me fear not i am the first and the last i am he that liveth and was dead Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. As we come to worship this evening, may we rejoice in our risen Saviour. I am he that liveth, was dead, and behold, alive forevermore. Peace all of our life to the keys of hell and death and peace. We'll seek the Lord's face briefly in prayer. Our gracious Father, we pray that like John, that we will be humbled in thy presence this evening, but we pray that the great truths of Christ will bring comfort afresh to the souls of thy people, and we pray that through our meeting this evening, that our Lord's name will be that which is exalted and honoured. So grant us help, we pray, to worship thee aright. We're going to sing together, please, the words of the hymn 18. The hymn 18 on page 182, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Hymn number 18.
Lord's face together in prayer. Let's look to the Lord together for the Lord's help in our time together this evening. Our gracious Father, we do come to thee this evening rejoicing in thy greatness, rejoicing in thy majesty. O oh Lord, we thank thee that our God is the Almighty. O oh Lord, we thank thee that thou art sovereign over all. O oh Lord, we thank thee for thy greatness, thy wisdom demonstrated in creation. Lord, we rejoice most especially. God's graciousness and redemption. What we earned was judgment and destruction. The wages of sin is dead. But, O oh Lord, we rejoice in that great gift of God, the gift of eternal life. We thank Thee for the day when each believer in this gathering had their eyes opened. They were brought to see the awfulness of their condition, but the great offer in Christ. Oh Lord, we desire that in our gathering tonight that we will not only be instructed afresh in our duty, but oh Lord, we desire that we will see him again. Oh Lord, we pray that we will see the one who is the perfect man, the one who went about doing good. And oh Lord, we pray that in seeing him, that we will be more like him. We thank thee for our standing in him. Lord, we we belong that we would be more like our lovely Lord. Form us, we pray, to his image. O oh Lord, come then, we ask, and work in our midst this evening. We pray that it will be very evident that the Lord is a word for every soul. Build us up in faith and holiness, we ask. O oh Lord, we pray that the end that we will be able to say that it was good for us to have been here in the Lord's house, that again we have met with our God. O oh Lord, we commend each one here to thy care. Thou knowest every trial that we go through, thou knowest every burden that we bear. And O oh Lord, we pray that you will sustain your dear children through your word. Pray for those that are going through times of particular anxiety. And we pray that they will be enabled this evening to cast their every care upon thee, knowing that thou dost care for us. O oh Lord, again we pray that thou will build thy church in this city. We recognize that we are a small company, and yet we thank thee that we have a mighty God, and we look to thee that we might know the power of God upon the work in this place. And we cry to thee that this place will be the birthplace of many a soul, that many blinded eyes will be opened and sinners turned from ungodliness unto thy sin. So grant us health throughout our time here this morning, or this evening rather, and we pray all glory will be unto our Lord's name. Amen. We're going to turn again in our hymn books. We're turning this time to the Psalm section, the Psalm 37. The Psalm 37. These words were read at the men's prayer meeting last week. They're very relevant for us at all times, but certainly to our 
congregation these days, for evil doers fret not thou thyself unquietly, nor do thy envy bear to those that work in equity. Not then to fret because of evil doers, but rather to trust in the Lord and to delight ourselves in Him. And so we're singing the first five verses of the psalm, ending with the words that bring to pass shall be. <laughs> the Ammonites, and prophesy against them, and say unto the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord God, thus saith the Lord God, because thou saidst, Aha, against my sanctuary when it was prevailed, and against the land of Israel when it was desolate, and against the house of Judah when they went into captivity. Behold, therefore I will deliver thee to the men of the east for possession. Uh, they shall set their palaces in thee, and make their dwellings in thee. They shall eat thy fruit, and they shall drink thy milk. And I will make Rabbah a stable for camels, and the Ammonites a couching place for flocks. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. For thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast clapped thine hands and stamped with the feet, and rejoiced in heart with all with all thy despite against the land of Israel. With all thy despite, rather, against the land of Israel. Behold, therefore, I will stretch out mine hand upon thee, and will deliver thee for a spoil to the heathen, and I will cut thee off from the people, and I will cause thee to perish out of the countries. I will destroy thee, and thou shalt know but I am the Lord. Now saith the Lord God, because that Moab and Seir do say, Behold, the house of Judah is like unto all the heathen. Therefore, behold, I will open the side of Moab from the cities, from the cities which are on the frontiers, on his frontiers. The glory of the country, Beth Jeshimon, Baalmeon, and Kirath Unto the men of the east with the Ammonites, 
and will give them in possession that the Ammonites may not be remembered among the nations. I will execute judgments upon Moab, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Thus said the Lord God, because that Edom have dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and have greatly repented and revenged himself upon them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand upon Edom, and will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to mine anger, and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out my hand upon the Philistines, and I will cut off the Inherit things and destroy the remnant of the sea coast. I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes. And they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall lay my vengeance on them. And then there, the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious truth. We're going to have the larger catechism at this point in the meeting. question 122 and we will repeat the answer please together what is the sum of the six commandments which contain our duty to man the sum of the six commandments which contain our duty to man is to love our neighbor as ourselves and to do to others what we would have them to do to us and so the six commandments, speaking of our duty to man, are the last six. And so if we take the first four, dealing with our duty to God, the last six then dealing. Uh, the first four dealing with our duty to God, the last six dealing with our, our duty to our fellow man, our neighbour. Uh, and these words then are often referred to as the second table of the law. The first dealing with our duty to God, our demand of love perfect love before God, the second then our duty toward our neighbour, our love toward, the love that we ought to have toward our neighbour. And so if you look with me please in Matthew's Gospel chapter 22, Matthew's Gospel chapter 22, we have a summary of this second table. Matthew 22, in verse 37, we have a summary of the first table of the law, I shall love the Lord thy God. And then in verse 39, Matthew 29, 39, the second is like it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And we see there that there is such a thing as self-love. Now there is a self-love which is inordinate and sinful. I remember at school hearing people saying, I suppose maybe people that are good at sport, he loves himself. Uh, maybe I was overthinking, but I used to think, well, is that always a bad thing to love yourself? Surely the Bible implies that there is such a thing as self-love. Now, if it's pride and the self-love over achievement, and that of course is the sinful, and yet the words that the Lord speaks here, love thy neighbor as thyself, shows that there is such a thing as love for self that is right. And as we would love and care for ourselves, then there is to be a love and care for others. Aren't we to have care about our testimony? Aren't we to seek to preserve a good name for the Lord's honor, of course, ultimately? But nonetheless, we are to seek to preserve a good name, that is love for self. But then we are to apply that to others, we are to care for their 
good name their reputation as well. Uh, and therefore the commandment says, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Uh, and the, the catechism answer identifies that this has a relationship then with what we call the golden rule, which is spoken of in Matthew 7, Matthew 7 verse 12. Matthew 7 verse 12, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law, and the prophets and our Lord was making clear then that not only is that second great commandment not something that's new, it was always taught in the Old Testament, so the golden rule is not something new. This is the law and the prophets, but as it's described here then, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. That as you would expect to be treated well, uh, with respect and so on, and so we should deal with others in a good way, love thy neighbour as thyself. I remember how there were those that sought to limit who our neighbours are and so the Lord taught the parable of the Good Samaritan and we can really say then that the Good Samaritan, or sorry, our neighbour is the one that we have the ability to help in time of need, the one that we can show care and consideration to. And this afternoon is reading some works of a boss in this matter of the Golden Rule and he was referring to how uh, very often even among the unconverted that there will be mention of the Golden Rule even if they don't use that particular phrase um, but they, they will say something that sounds like what we have set forth there in the Gospel of Matthew treat others as you would like to be treated but boss says we are not really keeping the Golden Rule unless our motive for keeping it is love to God and the desire to do God's will. And so he is saying that as those who are unconverted say that they live by this particular law, I treat others as I would like to be treated. Voss argues that really they are not keeping that at all because we can only keep that if we keep the first table of the law in mind. That our first duty is to love God. And following that, flowing from that then, that we seek to love others and minister to them. And so he says, those who keep the golden rule for either, uh, he puts keep in inverted commas, those who keep the golden rule for either selfish or humanitarian reasons are not really keeping the golden rule at all. No one can really even begin to keep the golden rule until he is born again of the Holy Spirit love for God has been implanted in his heart. Now while when the ungodly fail then, even in the very thing they set out to achieve, may we then, who are the Lords, have this desire that first and foremost we will live before the Lord and to look to the Lord continually then, that we might obey what he has instructed us to do, to love others, as we would expect to be loved, to treat others. These thoughts to your hearts that we will be made more like Christ, the one, of course, who is the perfect neighbour. I want to welcome you again to the meeting this evening. Uh, thank you all for coming to join with us. Uh, I did mention this morning the meetings with the Trinitarian Bible Society and the flyers for that on the table, but I think I omitted to mention the quarterly record, so the quarterly record is available it's in the little stand here at the door. And to do take those, there's a copy free for every household to take those after the meeting. And the rest of the announcements are in the church bulletin. We're going to turn again in our hymn books, please. And we are turning to the hymn number 67. Sixty-seven. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow 
and of the Lord. If you'll joy and comfort, give you take it then. Hymn 67, page 202, remain seated at the beginning of the hymn. chapter 24 that time was up for Jerusalem it was indeed to be destroyed the word of God was about to be fulfilled and in the chapters that follow them at the beginning of chapter 25 attention it is now brought to the nations round about and so we'll come to this chapter 25 this evening with the Lord's help we'll look to the Lord for his help as we come and 
meditate on his word this evening. Our gracious Father, we thank thee, dear Lord, for thy truth. And we ask now as we come and meditate upon thy word that the help of God will be given. O oh Lord, I pray that that promised help of the Holy Spirit of God we will be granted to this vessel and O oh Lord I pray that thy truth will be taken and sealed to every waiting soul. Grant that help then from on high. We pray in our Lord's name. Amen. Amen. The English Baptist preacher F. B. Meyer spoke of a Christian man when he would open up a, a newspaper he would say let us see what our Heavenly Father is doing in the world. Let us see what our Heavenly Father is doing in the world. And it would seem that that man had a right view of world events. And he was interpreting world events through a correct lens. But sadly, there are some Christians and they interpret their Bibles through what they read in the newspaper. But we are to do so the other way around. We are to interpret what we see by what we read in the Word of God. And in God's Word we see God's sovereign hand in everything. Therefore, as we read the newspaper, or however we like to keep informed of, how, of what has taken place, we are to see God's sovereign hand in all. And there is a danger that we get this idea that since God is building his kingdom, that since Christ is building his church, then the Lord really is not very interested in anything else that is taking place. That what politicians and governments do doesn't really matter. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. God is sovereign over all. And maybe there was a view like that among the people of Judah. Perhaps there were those that had an idea of something like this. That God takes interest in Judah because we are his elect people. We are that elect nation. We are the seed of Abraham. But God doesn't really take interest in anything to do with the other nations. Well, if any were thinking that way, Ezekiel 25 and the chapters that follow shatter that particular theory. Because God holds the nations to account. And in chapter 25, four nations are addressed, and it needs to be remembered that each one of these were enemy nations of the Jewish people. And so they were the Ammonites, and then the Moabites, the Edomites, and then the Philistines. The nations of Ammon and Moab, they were the descendants of Lot. Remember that very sad scene where the daughters of Lot had that incestuous relationship with their father, and two children were conceived and born as a result. Ammon and Moab. And so these nations have a, a physical relationship, we could say, uh, with Judah. Then Edom. The, the Edomites were the descendants of Esau. And they lived them uh, in Seir. And then finally the Philistines. Uh, they're an ancient enemy. Now we read of, especially in the latter period of the judges uh, and into the kingdom years, Perhaps most famously, and when we think of the Philistines, we think of that scene of David's killing of Goliath, the Philistine. The various sins are identified in these nations. And the Lord is going to judge these nations for these sins that are listed. And so in verse 3, we read of one of the sins of the Ammonites. They say unto the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God, Because thou sayest, Aha, 
against my sanctuary when it was profaned and against the land of Israel when it was desolate. Verse 6, For thus saith the Lord God, Because thou hast clapped thine hands and stamped with the feet, and rejoiced in heart, of all thy despite against the land of Israel. The, the people of Ammon rejoiced to hear of and to see the suffering of Jerusalem and Judah. And so as the news reached them of what had happened to the temple, and they said, ah, they rejoiced it. There's no pity for what that city endured. And then we come to the read of Moab, and in verse 8, thus saith the Lord God, because that Moab and Seir do say, Behold, the house of Judah it is like unto the heathen. Behold, the house of Judah is like unto the heathen. But they were making this clear that really Judah was no different than any other nation. That their God was nothing. And this, of course, if Judah was thinking right, is the claim that they would have made, we are different because our God is the Lord. The Moab and Seir said, the house of Judah is like unto the heathen. All of the nations are really the same. But it was to say, really, that God was nothing. And then, if you read of Edom, and down in verse 12, that they were taking vengeance and revenge. Thus saith the Lord God, because that Edom have dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and greatly offended, and revenged himself upon them. And then finally, the section dealing with the Philistines, it also speaks of vengeance, as well as an old hatred. We read that at the end of the verse 15, or enmity. And what is clear then in each of these cases is that God is going to deal with them. And again, through the chapter, we, we read of what the I don't know that there is a God in heaven. It was that they might know that the God of Judah was the living and true God. And so, for example, at the end of verse 7, I will destroy thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And when we come to this chapter, we have to ask the chapter to follow, and others like it, so we have chapters like this in Isaiah and some of the other prophets. Why are these chapters in the Bible? I say that because it's very unlikely that the nation of Ammon, for example, actually heard this particular prophecy, or that the Philistines all heard this word that the Lord said against them. But it was recorded for the Lord's people to read. And equally, it has been recorded for us to read. So why is this in the Bible? These words were recorded for the good of Judah at that time, and they are recorded for our good today. There are lessons that we can learn from what God would say to the enemy. Lessons for us to learn from what God says to the enemy. And that's what I want to look at this evening with the Lord's help. I want to see first of all with you the deliberations, that is, we are to be deliberating, the deliberations from God's consistent dealings. God's consistent dealings. And you see, we are to be stricken with this reality when we come to this chapter that God is not indifferent to sin in the nations. Now, leading up to this chapter, we have been saying over and over again that God was not indifferent to sin in Judah. 
judgment began at the house of God. But judgment did not end. So yes, judgment begins at the house of God, but judgment most certainly does not end there. Remember in Acts chapter 17, and the Apostle Paul spoke of the times of ignorance. And he was speaking of really the whole Old Testament era when generally speaking these nations and others were left without the gospel. Now there was that testimony that God had upon the hearts of man and God has upon the hearts of man. But Paul spoke of the times of ignorance God winked at. But now he commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now when it speaks there of God winking, God in a sense overlooking, it's not in the sense of indifference. The, the winking, the overlooking there is in the sense that God permitted the ungodly to go on and get the just out. God permitted them to go on in their hardness and to be destroyed for their sin. But Paul says now there's a change in Acts 17. The gospel goes to the nation, and so very clearly to all the nations goes this very clear call, repent. And so we were seeing then in Ezekiel chapter 25, that while God allowed the nations to go on in their sin, that does not mean that they were not held to account. God holds them to account. And what we have here is a scene of judgment. The whole scene here, surely, is of a court case. And there comes to the court evidence. As we've shown you some of that evidence already. Well, the charge and the evidence. And as the evidence is brought, the charge is shown to be correct. The nations are found guilty. And the sentence is read out. Now what must be obvious then is that these nations were guilty of law breaking. They had broken the law of God. Now we must understand that because there is a popular view among some Christians that the law only ever had anything to do with Old Testament Israel. And that presents many problems. But here's one. If the law only ever had something to do with Old Testament Israel, what law have the nations broken? If there is no law for the nations, then how can they stand trial for breaking the law? It's very clear then, isn't it? That they're examined against the holy law of God and they are found to be guilty. And so the same is true concerning the ungodly today. If there's no such thing as the law of God for the sinner, how is he going to be judged? What is he guilty of? How can he be charged with sin if the law has nothing to do with him? You see, there is the law. God demands obedience, perfect obedience obedience of all men. Man is a lawbreaker and therefore he is condemned. And so if you follow with me then, God is holding these nations to account. They have broken the law of God. And we see then that God has a high standard. God will not even allow the, the idle word to be ignored. And so you imagine as the Ammonites, for example, heard of the destruction of the temple, when the, the people laughed, it was something they did almost impulsively, quickly. Maybe they almost immediately forgot all about it and carried on with their business. But God saw it. God noted it. God was holding them to a high standard. And to our reflection, and I believe is something to be like this. If God holds a high standard for the ungodly, 
If God says to the ungodly, you ought not to have had those words of mocking, then how much more the Lord would ho hold a high standard for us as his people. Now, in no way am I teaching salvation by works. What I am saying is if we are saved by the gospel, uh, our living is to be transformed. And what we have in this chapter are the sins of the natural man. The sins that are listed are the sins of the natural man, and these are sins that we are to wrestle against. And so, I've said then, there is this deliberation from God's consistent dealings. We are to say, well, if the Lord would say, the Ammonites ought not to have done this, how much more the Lord would say to us, we ought not to do it. And so there was the sin of rejoicing, in the downfall of others. And so I uh, pointed that out in verse 6 where there was this celebration. When others were in a time of calamity. And we are reminded then that we are not to rejoice in the calamity of others. Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them do we? We're not to rejoice over those who weep. Hebrews 13 verse 3, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Now it is true that the sins of these nations were exacerbated by the fact that they had sinned against you. And yet even if the Ammonites had rejoiced in the suffering of some other nation, it would still have been sin. So yes, it was exacerbated by the fact that it was against Judah, the chosen people of God. We are to remember, God has made all men in the image of God. To rejoice in the calamities that others are experiencing it is uncharitable. It's uncompassionate. We are not to make humor at the miseries of others. Proverbs 17, verse 5. Whoso mocketh the poor reproacheth his maker, and he that is glad at calamities shall not go unpunished. He that is glad at calamities shall not go unpunished unpunished. And don't we all love those words of Lamentations 3.22 It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Hasn't that often been phrased in another way? When we see the suffering of another, we say, there go I. But the grace of God. There go I. Here idle words were spoken Sin of rejoicing in the downfall of others, the Lord will hold it to account. Then there's also the sin of the low view of God. In verse 8, where it says, Thus said the Lord God, because that Moab and Seir do say, Behold, the house of Judah is like unto all the heathen. Now the implication of those words is that if Judah is just like the other nations, then Judah's God is just like the false gods. So if Judah is no different, then her God is no different. Now, this was actually the sin of the Assyrians in the time of King Hezekiah. Remember when Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came against the, the city of Jerusalem, and Hezekiah rightly was exhorting the people to put their trust in the Lord and Sennacherib said let not Hezekiah deceive you and he went on to say that no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of my hand and so the Assyrians were saying as we had gone against nation after nation they all went to pray to their gods 
But none of their gods were able to answer. None of their gods were able to help them. And so the Assyrians were saying, what's the point in praying to your God either? <coughs> but he missed the point. The God, Judah, is the living God. Now, just as the Assyrians in those days in Boab and Seir here had a low view of God, we can be guilty of the same sin. In a different way, yes. But yet, the same sin. Don't we often have this idea that the Lord has worked in another day? But we're not really expecting Him to work in ours. And the, the atheism that persists, uh, persists in this nation, uh, at least confessed atheism, we reflect, well, it's just too hard. We have a wrong view of the Lord, a, a wrong view of his ability to work. We are to depend on it. But then there was also the sin of revenge. <laughs> Verse 12, Thus saith the Lord God, be, be, because that Edom uh, dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and it goes on then to talk about revenge. Perhaps there were those in this land, despite the, the passage of time, that still were angry at Jacob's deceit of Esau. Perhaps there were those, that despite all of these years later, they were still angry that Jacob had gone into Isaac wearing Esau's clothes and the goatskins. And still, after all this time, they wanted revenge. They were unbrotherly. And that's actually one of the sins of Edom that's called out in the little book of Obadiah. This unbrotherliness. You had a physical relationship to the Lord's people, but you didn't treat them in that way. Now, our lives are miserable if we're continually playing the game of seeking revenge. If you turn with me to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, and verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life, then you live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Don't be full of this desire for revenge. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather. Give place up to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire in his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And some of you are familiar with those children's book stories from Grandma's Attic. Uh, and in that series, uh, there's a story of a, a girl, her school book disappeared. Uh, and it disappeared just before it was to be handed in to the teacher for assessment. Uh, and what happened was the school cleaner found the book on the floor and she put it into the wrong desk. So it was back in those days when you lifted up the lid and you, you stored your books inside. But the book went into the desk of a pupil that was jealous and bitter against And so the jealous girl on discovering the book in her desk and knowing
girl who is the victim is challenged by these words at the end of Romans chapter 12. Now she likes the words about heaping coals on the enemy's head. And that's what actually brings her to the passage. But then she realizes how the coals are to be put upon the head. It's not by revenge, but rather overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. Vengeance it is the Lord's prerogative. We are to leave it to him. And then another sin in Ezekiel chapter 5 is the sin of growing resentment. At the end of verse 15, it talks about the old hatred. And the word there is the same Hebrew word, uh, speaking of the enmity uh, in Genesis chapter 3. You see, the Philistines had been warned many, many times, haven't they? <coughs> uh, we think of that time when Dagon, their great idol, the fish god, uh, the idol fell down before the ark. They propped it back up, but it fell again. We think of that famous scene, that well-known scene of the destruction of Goliath. How they had made that promise. If you slay Goliath, will be your servants. They haven't kept their end of the bargain. The old enmity persisted. Growing different. And they held on to it. They treasured it. What a challenge then this passage is to us. Are we like the Philistines? Are we feeding some bitterness? Is there some injury that has been done to us and we hold on to it? It's no different. We have these deliberations from God's consistent dealings. Yes, God deals with the house of God, but he holds the nations to a high standard. We go back then to this recognition. How much more you would say to me, do what you want. Then I want to see, secondly, the, the comfort from God's covenantal care. The comfort from God's covenantal care. Now, initially, reading through the chapter, it might look that this chapter is all about judgment and destruction uh, and certainly there's a lot of judgment and uh, a lot of destruction and yet what we see in this chapter is that God is the God who fulfills his covenant because if you remember right back to the Lord speaking to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 Genesis chapter 12 and the verse 3 I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. We can write these words over Ezekiel chapter 25. The Lord says these nations are cursed because they were cursed in Judah. God has got a covenant. God has kept his promise. The nations, you see, fail to understand the great truths of what the temple was teaching. They fail to grasp that the Lord's people are the apple of his eye. They rejected the truth of God's elected grace. And so they treated God's people as if they were no different from anybody else. The Lord is the Lord of covenant, says. As they have cursed you, they are cursed. But here is the comfort then. The Lord has not forgotten his covenant. Now remember, for, for the first readers, for the first audience, they were so unworthy. And the captives had been taken into exile because of their sin. The city was destroyed because of sin. And yet the Lord says, 
these nations are cursed because of what they have done to the Lord's people. And if we understand our hearts are right, uh, we fall short of that. But if we understand anything of our hearts, we fall short. We are like Judah. And yet we are loved with an everlasting the Lord's grace is greater than all our failure, and our failures are great. And so when we see in our days the mockery of the church, and when we see all of these intents to destroy Christian witness, we can take comfort. The Lord sees it all. And despite our feelings, the Lord keeps his own comfort from God's covenant of care. And then I want to see finally with you the amazement of God's redemptive provision. In this chapter, we have the principle of reaping what you sow. And that's very evident. Verse 17, I will execute great vengeance. Now, while the words are translated differently there, it's actually the same in Hebrew. Um, so we could translate the beginning of verse 17. I will deal great revenge. So the Philistines say, have dealt by revenge. What is the Lord going to do? He is going to deal great revenge because vengeance belongs unto the Lord. And so what are we seeing then here? We see just judgment. But praise God. The Bible not only reveals just judgment. The Bible reveals a substitute that has been provided to take as where the judgment that we have sown. Which would point us to what our Saviour endured on Calvary. And in verse 6, we have there, towards the end of the verse, a, a reference to the, the despite against the land of Israel. And remember that word, the English word despite appears in Hebrews chapter 10, 29. Those who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, they have done despite unto the despair of grace. upon thee and will deliver thee for a spoil to the heathen and I will cut thee off from the people so this is what the Lord is going to do to this nation but you think of those words in verse 7 I will stretch out my hand upon thee what happened at Calvary the hand of the Lord was stretched out against his son as our sin was taken and led upon him as it speaks of a cutting off, this is the language of Isaiah 53, verse 8. He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. This striking of the hand. Verse 11, I will execute judgments. Doesn't that speak of the cross? Verse 13 speaks of desolation. Verse 14 speaks of fury. Verse 17 speaks of the execution of great vengeance. And I put it to you, it's all the language of Calvary. Where yes, these nations deserve what they receive. But for us, there is one who has stepped forward and said, I will take it in their place. Therefore, I say, we are to stand amazed at God's redemptive provision. 
You see, the words that we deserve to have against us are the words that are written against Ammon, Moab, Edom, and yet what does the Lord say to us? See the one who bore the wrath. See the one who took the judgment. See the one that has met the just demands of a holy God. And so I come back to what I said early in the message. Why is the Lord doing this? The Lord is doing this so that the nations would know that He is God, the adversary. Why has God sent His Son? Why did our Savior endure Calvary? That we would know He is God. Is there any evidence greater than this? Is there any evidence greater concerning the greatness of God's love, the greatness of God's plan, the greatness of God's love, than that Christ would step forward and say, I will bear it in their place. I great is our God. In the chapter we read of the destruction of strongholds. If these nations trusted in their cities, in their gates, strongholds but they would be destroyed Christ is the stronghold to which we resort because he endured the wrath by his sufferings he's the stronghold in which we can trust and therefore any therefore anyone listening to the message tonight is still unconverted you deserve the destruction. We run to him afresh. As we see in this chapter all of our own unworthiness, we have fallen short and continue to do so. Praise God for his place here. May the Lord bless his word this evening. Let's go by in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for the searchlight of thy word. And we recognize, in a sense, it's easy for us to look at the sin in the nations, the sin in the heathen around us, and to say, Lord, thy word comes and say then a fresh search me, O God. That our hearts will be searched out. That sin, sacred and private sin, will be less. Lord, we will rejoice in the gospel and live in the light of it. Continue with us, we pray. We will conclude, please, the words of the hymn 261. And 261 in times like these. You need a saviour in times like these. You need an anchor. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and lives the stone of that rock. Two, six, one. And we'll stand together as we sing the main standing for the foundation.
our Savior, glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and ever.